be interested. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, we're going to go ahead and get started with class tonight. Tonight, we're finally going to wrap up the seven churches. We talked about all of them, but we're going to wrap up just to give you a brief summary of what those churches are so we can go into the next um, the next summary of what we're going to be talking about with Revelation. So you begin to realize, I, I know we spent a lot of time on these seven churches, but I really wanted you to get an understanding of the spirit that the Lord was having to deal with in these churches, and and we have the same thing going on today. But when we began to look at the end time, many have misconceptions concerning uh, these these seven churches, and I I find myself really trying to re I guess you call it re specify these churches because it's not really seven churches; it's actually seven locations. There's still only one church, uh, it, which is the church that the Lord started. But that church was in seven different locations. And uh, that's why they call it the church at Smyrna, the church at Philadelphia, the church at uh, Ephesus, because that's where the church is operating. We have to go back and look at the concept of what Jesus started. So when you begin to look at the end times, Jesus made a distinction. He did it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When he made that uh, that decision to share with them, he said, listen, he said, all the major events of the end of time are not going to happen until, until after these things happen first in the church. So that's why we took a, a left turn and got into the church, because we're the part that actually uh, happens first when it comes to the end time. For example, we're the ones that are going to be completed, perfected, raptured out. Then the fullness of the judgment of God is going to hit the earth. Now, when you look at the book of Revelation, we have to remember, too, that the whole book of Revelation was written to these seven churches. And when you look at how it starts out in Revelation 1, verse 9 and 10, it says, I, John, who also am, am bro your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the hour that is called Patmos. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet. So remember, John has been cast to this aisle. And of course, we find out that he's blind. So he cannot physically see. So he's letting us know here he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. But he had heard a great voice that we read later where we continue to tell him what he's going to tell the churches. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book. Now remember, he's blind. So what he is seeing is in the spirit realm. And he said, send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, under Ephesus, under Smyrna, under Pergamos, under Thyatira, under Sardis, and under Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. You'll find in that 18th verse of that same chapter, he said, I am, this is the Lord speaking, said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, uh, amen, and have, look at this, the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So you see, he was setting the, the timeline, laying things out the way it was going to be. Now, there's something else that I really, the Lord reminded me of it today as I was uh, just, just going over the scriptures. He said, don't you know that there's only one book that I did most of the speaking in? And it's the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. You know, John was narrating, but the Lord was doing most of the speaking. No other book in your Bible has more of Jesus himself speaking directly as to what's going to happen than the book of Revelation. So when, when I talk about reading the red writing, you can make the entire book of Revelation except for the times that John was actually describing certain things as Jesus talking. He talked directly. This was not just any Jesus talking, but this was the resurrected Savior. This was the Messiah. This was the Christ, the anointed one, speaking, seated at the right hand of God, was actually speaking and sharing with John the end of time. So this is a very vital book. Many times we run from this book instead of running to it. We should be running to it and recognize that when the Lord was speaking in Revelation, he was not talking to every church. He was talking to seven specific located churches. 
So why did he choose these seven churches? Why was he talking to just these seven churches? Why did he send a, send a message to them? Why did he say that they were angels? Why did he uh, refer to them the way he did? When you look at it from that perspective, it changes everything. Mm -hmm. Firstly, all the churches did not receive the book of Revelation when it was first written. It was given to those seven churches. Mm -hmm. Now, there were hundreds of churches or hundreds of locations where the church was meeting during this time, but there was only seven that Jesus specifically called out. Ask yourself a question sometimes. Why did he do that? Why did he choose these seven uh, locations, the church at these locations? Why did he pick them out? Why did he share with them the end of time and everything that was going to happen? What was happening in them right then and what was going to happen to them in the future? Why? These are things that we as Bible students need to search out. Look into it. Examine it. it it'll keep you up all night to have me because I find out that a lot of it, you can't just find the answers. You have to rely on the Spirit of God to kind of share with you exactly why. I don't know why God does half the things he do, but he's God. And when he makes a decision to do something, we have to follow along with him. That means, as, as it said in this particular book, you can't add to it, you can't take away, but you can try and understand it. And that's what studying God's word is all about. These seven churches, he was specific. He chose them out. Out of these seven churches, only two of them were working at the level that are operating at the level that the Lord uh, desired for all of them to operate. If you took seven churches, two out of seven, you're talking probably uh, a little less than 30% or one-third of the churches in that day were doing what they were supposed to do. So why would we be so so out of sorts when we see the majority of the churches today not doing what they should be doing? I think the percentage is probably about the same. Probably a third of the believers today are walking in the fullness of what God would have them to walk in. This is a good Bible example of what goes on in the church. And you can see the pattern of how God works. When you look at the Old Testament, how it was foretold how Jesus was going to come, how the Savior of the world was going to come, and how when he finally did come, you had those that doubted. Like, well, no, he needs to be, you know, at least to be more um, fanfare. It needs to be this or that. And if we're not careful, although he's telling us about the end times, he's telling us about what to watch out for, we can be the same way. We can miss it just like they did when Jesus came. They missed it. A lot of them said, no, you know, this is not, he's not the Messiah. He's not the one. Well, we have to be careful. Even when the letters are written to these churches, we need to take note. What, if what are they saying to us so we won't get in the same spirit of the same attitude as the people in those days did, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because they didn't line up with what they thought of what they were foretold, they were thinking, well, this is all. Well, let us take note from them that what we're reading today, although it was speaking to those seven churches, we can still pull from them to make sure we don't get in that same attitude where that's not for us. That was for them, and I can't really take anything from them. So, so let's look at the timetable. Was Jesus actually born on A.D. 1? How many of you know that, that A.D. actually... Exactly. Uh, we say after his death. That's what we call it. There's another uh, Greek word for it, but anyway, we call it A.D. Was Jesus actually born on 1 A.D.? A lot of folks say no. A lot of them say that the scholars say he was actually born on uh, 4 A.D. Now, I don't know how they figure all that stuff <laughs> out. And it's not It's not my... my uh, it's not my time and, and season to be able to explain all of that. But anyway, let's look at let's look at some 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 logistics here in numbers. Uh -huh. Okay, if Jesus was born in AD four, he started his public ministry thirty at thirty three, so that would make it uh, uh, AD thirty seven when he was on the earth. Okay, when you look at the, these books, what is the first gospel that was actually recorded? The smallest gospel or the shortest gospel, which is which one? John. Yeah. Mark. Mark. The shortest gospel is Mark. Mm -hmm. That was the first gospel that was written. Mm -hmm. 
Now, according to the the uh, the the timeline, they say that a that uh, that Mark was written around forty five to fifty A.D. If Jesus actually was resurrected thirty seven A.D., then that would mean that maybe around forty to forty five years after the Lord left. It's when the first gospel was written, which was Mark. What was the second gospel that was written? It was Matthew. Mm -hmm. And what was the third one? It was Luke. And each one is about a 10-year period between each one. <clears throat> what is the last gospel that was written? And what is the oldest book in your New Testament Bible books? Matthew, Genesis. For well, hundred points. <laughs> the oldest one. Oldest, oldest New Testament book in the Bible. Not Old Testament, but the oldest New Testament book. Which one is it? Well, it must be Matthew. Not quite. Keep going. It's real easy. It's real John. simple. John. It's not John. John. It's 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 which book? Which is the oldest book. Now, the oldest gospel is John. But which is the oldest book? It's got a book in the title. Now, what book in the title? It's a good book, too. <laughs> the book of Revelation. Revelation. It's the oldest New Testament book in your Bible. The book of Revelation. It's older than all the rest of it. As a matter of fact, when you go back and study it and search it out, you begin to realize then that this was the last book that was written. Mm -hmm. So this book is going to be more prevalent to the end of time than any other book that's been written. Why? Because it deals about the end of time. Because who? It talks about the end of time. It talks about the end of time, uh, but... It actually is probably one of the greatest um, revelations concerning the end of time because of who? Jesus. Like I said before, he is the one who spoke this to John. He's the one. This was not John receiving it through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This was John receiving this through a direct uh, uh, conversation coming directly from Jesus. It's the only book in your Bible. Do you see why it's important as believers that when it comes to the end time events, we center our folk and focus our attention on the book of Revelation? Okay, I mean, so it was after the ascension or before? Huh? After the ascension or before? It was about Revelation? It was, after the ascension of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Or before his ascension? After the ascension of Jesus. Which means he was already on the right hand of the Father. He was already seated on the right hand of the Father when he gave his revelation. This book, the book of Revelation, came in around A.D. 95, which was some, what, 60-something years after the Lord was resurrected. So, you see, it's the oldest. When you begin to look at all the books in the New Testament, it is the oldest book. It's the last recorded book. Why? Because John was, was on the Isle of Patmos, and he thought he was going to die there, but the Lord said, no, you're not. He said, you're going back. And when you go back, I want you to go to seven locations. And those, the church operating in those seven locations, I need you to take this message to them. So then the book of Revelation was not given to the entire church in the beginning. But it was given to who? Seven churches. And their responsibility was to do what? Share it with all the rest of the churches. Remember, there was probably hundreds of locations where the church was operating. Remember this. The building, church buildings, church edifices, talking about brick and mortar, wood and stubble, whatever, did not exist until around 300 to 400 years after the Lord had already ascended to heaven. 
So what kind of church was it? Where was it operating? House How church. was it operating? Go ahead. In a house church. It was a house church. Now we just about have to fight folks when we say let's have church in the house. The church started out in the house. Mm -hmm. They went from house to house to house until uh, Constantine made Christianity legal mm -hmm. and to be a, a representative of the religion of the Roman Empire. Until then, it was all in secret. They met from house to house in secret. And I've got several different scriptures referring to that in our lesson tonight. But when you began to visualize the church back then and visualize the church now, think about this. With us now, church is a building. But in the beginning, the church was not a building. It was men and women meeting in the building. Today, we have men and women giving their lives for a building. I mean, that, that's, that's how they identified themselves uh, through a building. Yet the church from the very beginning was not identified by the building. It was identified by the people in the building. Which simply means then that when you begin to examine how the Lord was speaking to the church here, he was not speaking to a denomination. He was not speaking to Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Holiness, what, he was not speaking to a denomination because denominations did not exist back then. Denominations started after 400 years of the operation of the church. What was the, one of the first denominations that was started? Catholic. Well, I guess you can say that was the, the foundation, but the Catholic had this claim that they were the original church that they were the ones that Jesus started. That's what they had. But Martin Luther was one of the first ones to break loose from what they called the Catholic theology back then. He's the one who nailed the, what was it, 95 Theses on the door. So that was the beginning of the first breakup of the church from just being one church. When you begin to examine the scriptures there and you look at us today, you say, well, we're in the last of the last days. Today we have, I think I, I, I read somewhere thousands of denominations if you went into every single one. This city, this town, how many denominations in Franklin? Who knows? How many churches are in Franklin? About 30 how many? Thirty. If you count from coming in from Carolina all the way down, yeah, but you got storefront churches everywhere. I, I went in. I went into uh, in the in the South um, Franklin, and I began to see churches I have never. I've been here for what was it? Yeah. Ten years? Eight, eight years? Eight years? There churches there I didn't even know were there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw. I counted ten. Churches that I did not even know were there. <clears throat> and I drove to North Franklin on some of the streets, and I began to see churches. churches. I mean, they're everywhere. But yeah. we all have our individualized identities mm -hmm. connected to a denomination. Mm -hmm. What God wants us to understand is that we are the church. Mm -hmm. The church is not Baptist, it's not Methodist, it's not Holy, it's not Presbyterian. Christian. Uh, it, it, it's, it's Christian. And if you are a Christian, you're a part of God's church. Mm -hmm. Now, you may not be a part of any church denomination-wise, but if you are a believer, mm -hmm. if you believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, if you believe he is the Son of God, then you're the church. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard to receive. It's hard to comprehend. But in these end times, that's important. It's important because if you're not careful, mm -hmm. denominations are going to lead you away from being a true believer. <laughs> what do you mean? They're going to grab a hold of some of the things that are contrary or anti-Christ. Mm -hmm. And if you're committed more to a denomination as identifying you as a Christian more than the Bible, the word of God, you're going to be led astray. Somebody said, well, you know what? 
I was born this and I'm going to die this. But what if this goes to far left or far right? You still going to be a part of it? Yeah, I'm going to be one until I die. Mm. Are you a believer? Well, I think I am. Mm. Uh, well, what makes you think you are? Because uh, they told me I was. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm a member. I joined. Did you know if you go into the Bible, now this is, this is going to really sound crazy, but if you go into the Bible, you are not determined to be a Christian by denomination. It's not a denominational thing. It's a Bible thing. Do you believe? Now, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the Father, if you believe that he died for your sins, and if you accept him as your Lord, as your Savior, then you are a Christian. And that means that whether you are in uh, whatever denomination you're in, you are identified as a Christian. But do not let the denomination determine whether you remain a Christian or not. You got to go back to the word of God. And some will say, well, now you're just messing things up. You're just really confusing me now. I'm really all messed up. No, it's real simple. I do not have to be Baptist to be a Christian. I do not have to be Methodist. I do not have to be Presbyterian or Holiness. I have to be born again. Mm -hmm. I have to believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father. If we if we draw the line there, then in these end times, we're not going to be deceived. Because let me tell you, as you look at these different churches that Jesus dealt with, they were following different paths. Only two of them were doing what they should have been doing. And those two, what were they? Smyrna and Philadelphia. And Philadelphia. Those two, Jesus had nothing negative to say concerning their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Think about it. But there was a whole lot of negativity in the other five. Something to think about. And when you think about what the church represented then, when there was no church buildings per se, but it was only people representing the church. And you think about those seven books. Had it not been for men and women going out and reading those letters and getting the books out, the gospel wouldn't have been spread. So we have to remember, we are part of the church. When I talk about the gospel, when I spread the gospel, I'm being a part of the getting the gospel out. And I think about even the end times, you know, what about today? A lot of people won't come to a church. They, you know, it's too many things they've heard about church, but they will see your life. And you may be able to minister to them in the laundromat or in a small group because the Bible says, where two or three are gathered, I am in the midst. That's what Jesus said. So regardless of where your church is, if your church is in the house, if you are there and you got another one, you are representing the church. So again, it's very important that you proclaim the gospel, proclaim the truth, because some people won't come near the truth, but you can take the truth to them. And I think about why do we error sometimes? Why do we mess up sometimes? Because we don't know the truth. And I look at what Matthew 22 and 29 says. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do error, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So the world, a lot of them, even believers, they don't know the true unadulterated word of God. So it's our job to represent the truth. It's our job to make sure they get the truth as a church, whether you're in a building or not. You are the one that's carrying the truth. So we have to remember that, not just the way they did it then, but even now, we are carrying the books of the Bible. Not just revelation, but you are a carrier of those books. And the way we get the truth to them is not just living it, but sometimes it's a, a matter of one-on-one -on -one explaining. You know, somebody may come to you and say, well, I don't understand what this is saying. Can you help me with the truth? That's when we come in and give them wisdom and give them knowledge concerning what God is saying to them personally. So when you look at these two churches that were doing what they were supposed to do, they are not uh, clearly identifiable by a lot of churches today. What do you mean? Well, there's some churches today that teach that believers, if you're suffering, you're sinning. If you're going through hard times, then there's something not right in your life. They'll tell you straight up, if you're having to go to the cheese line, that's what they used to call it in my day. If you, <laughs> you know, I think it's food bank now. It was the cheese line back when I was growing up. But if you're having to go and beg for food and you're having to go and, 
and get on food stamps or you have to get some kind of government assistance as a believer, then you're not living everything you know to live. Because God is supposed to take care of all of your needs according to his riches and glory. So with, from that understanding, I'm to prosper. <coughs> I'm to be rich. I'm to be wealthy. I'm to have no need of anything. When you grab a hold of that kind of teaching without balancing it, then what you're doing is you're leading people to think that just because I'm suffering means I'm not a believer. That's a lie straight from the pits of hell. Yes, Why do you say that? Because the only two churches that were doing right were suffering. They were going through some things. But God was with them. He said to them, he said, just hang tight. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep being faithful because this world is not your home. But I got a home for you. I'm preparing for you. So don't worry about the world. Let them go to hell in a basket. Don't you hit your ride. My God, don't conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is not popular. As a matter of fact, somebody may say, well, I'm not going to sow anything to them. Well, you probably hadn't sold anything anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? God keeps it going because God wants the truth out. Do you mean that as a believer, I'm not supposed to prosper? A thousand times no. But I'm saying as a believer, be balanced. Do not think that just because bad things are happening to you, you have lost your salvation or you're doing something wrong in the sight of God. That's not how it's done, darling. It's in the word of God. Are you obeying the word? Are you doing what the word says? Are you lining up with the word that I don't care? Come hell or high water, you haven't lost a thing in God, but you've gained ground in him. Yes. Do I believe in prosperity for a believer? I do in a balanced way. What do you mean? I'm not going to spend my time trying to pursue wealth. Why? Because God said I'm to pursue him and he'll add the wealth. What did he say? I mean, I, sometimes I really, I don't understand what Bible some believers are reading. <laughs> I really don't because my, my, my Bible says, look at this, look at this Smyrna church, for example, Revelation 2, 9 through 11. He, Jesus said to him, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Uh -huh. Look, they had tribulation and they had poverty. He said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. So they were suffering. He said, ye may be tried. So they were taken to court. They were tried. You shall have, not may have, but shall have what? Tribulation. He said, but what? Be faithful unto death. With your last breath, say, God is still God and Jesus is still Lord. He said, do that. And he that overcomes, which means you have to overcome. If you're a believer and you're not going through anything, then I would doubt whether your salvation is being worked out right. As a believer, stop barely making about going through. But God said it this way. He said, many are the afflictions of the who? The no, no, no. He, you, you know that ain't in the word. He said righteous? <laughs> you mean like those that are right living, yeah. going to be afflicted? Mm -hmm. We're going to have pains? Yes. We're going to hurt? Yes. We're going to have hard times? Yes. You mean God's not going to make an exception for us because we have the blood of the Lord in our veins? Uh -huh. All had a thorn in the side, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Said it Amen. So, so, but you know what? This is not popular. This is not going to win any support from a whole lot of believers today. Why? Because they think that just because they're born again, it's supposed to be sugar and spice and everything nice. I tell you, I, I would like to tell you my age story, but I, I guess I, uh, should I tell my age story? I think I should tell my age story. My age story is this. My mama used to, used to own a hundred chickens every year. And she'd raise those, those chickens and those, that she'd raise them up and they began to lay eggs. Well, when they would lay eggs, they would sit on the eggs, and the eggs would hatch out little bitties. You know, I mean, it was normal. Well, I, as smart as I was, I went into the, 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 the chicken coop one day, and I saw that a bunch of the eggs were cracked. And I said, my 
goodness, they are cracked. And I saw something moving in there. I said, they're trying to get out. Let me help them. Uh -uh. So what I did is I, my, mom was getting about a dozen eggs a day. I went in and I cracked every one of those eggs. <laughs> I cracked them all and freed those fittings. <laughs> they were able to get out and flop around. And I'm like, come on, ain't you just have to get them? I said, well, y'all going to dry out and you'll be okay. So I left them like that. Next one, mama, she knew who to call. My mama, she <laughs> always knew. It was two of us. My brother Ray and me, Earl. That <laughs> next day, <laughs> mama went to the chicken <laughs> coop. And the first thing come out of her mouth was, Earl! <laughs> They all died. I said, Mama, they were alive when I left them. I just helped them to get out of the shell. <laughs> she said, Boy, you ain't got no sense at all. They have to fight their way out of the shell so they'll be strong enough to survive. That's right. Well, I learned a valuable lesson. I, I got my butt tore up, but I still learned a valuable lesson. When I'm talking about hardship, tribulation, and having a breakthrough today. As a believer, when you got a breakthrough, as a believer, when you got to overcome, as a believer, when you got to go through something, it makes you stronger. Yes, it do. It makes you yes. stronger in God and solidifies your, your position in the Lord. Yes, do not, do, don't rue the day you get hardship, man. Listen, we wouldn't even be here with you today if it hadn't been for hardship. We would not be speaking to you today if it hadn't been for missing the mark so many times we finally figured out how to get it right. You know, you, you, you got to understand whatever you're going through, whatever's happening, God's going to bless you. He's going to add to you. Whatever you lose for the gospel's sake, God said, I'm going to restore. But that is not to be your focus. You say, well, I've got power. You know, God, I can cast out devils. I can raise the dead. I can do all manner of miracles. The devil wakes up every morning fearing my name, and he runs from me. God told the, the disciples, the seven who returned to him, he said, you don't need to be rejoicing about the power. You need to be rejoicing about the fact that your name is written in the book. Amen. Come on, daughters. Let's change our focus today as believers. Yes, I'm going to prosper. Yes, I'm going to go through. Yes, I'm going to have a hard time. Yes, I'm going to have to be tested in my faith in whatever's going on. But yes, that is all good. Mm -hmm. Jesus told this church at, at, at uh, Smyrna, he told them, he said, you know what? He said, you're going to be blessed because you're doing what I said to do. When you obey God, please put this in your little black book and read it every day. When you obey God, it does not free you from hardship. It strengthens you to go through. Amen. Most of the young people today don't know what it's like to go through. Mm -hmm. I've had my own children tell me, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm trying to raise my children so they don't have to suffer like I suffered. You don't understand, you wouldn't be the person you are if you hadn't suffered. Especially when you come over, that overcome that. My mama had us working. Man, five years old, mama, mama was what they call a tobacco stringer. You know, that's the one you hand tobacco to and they put it on the stick. Well, you, I, I don't have time to educate you on that one. But anyway, we were little things. Five years old, she waited until my brother turned five. See, we, we both, he, he was born in April, I was born in June, so... Uh, we had to wait for him to turn five. So I was already just about to turn six. But anyway, mama took us because nobody, she tried to get folks to hand to her. And she was fast, man. She was one of the fastest stringers there was. But nobody could keep up with her. So she come home. She took my, my brother and myself and she taught us how to hand her tobacco. And when we didn't hand it right, we got slapped upside the head with wet tobacco. 
I mean, hey, that's just the way it was back then. But we learned we had to stand on stools to hand to the back of the mom. And she was a short person, but we were still, we had to get on stools. And we hand it back. I was five years old. You got to understand, none of that hurt me. None of that took out of me. It put work, work ethics in me. Today, there's nothing too hard for me to do. You know, folks, to see what we've done here, they're like, well, who helped? Not a whole lot helped, but we did it. The ones that helped, helped, but the ones that didn't, didn't stop the ones who wanted to do, nor us. Why? Because hard work never killed no one. Now, not using wisdom in hard work has killed a whole lot of folks. <laughs> but, but hard work is good for you. So, so what do you say? I'm telling you, do not get caught up on this thing where if you're not prospering, you're doing something wrong. Or God is not pleased with you. That out of all these other churches, some of them were doing some right things and some of them were doing some bad things. But you look at these two churches and these two churches were going through. And I think about, you know, the suffering that we're talking about. And we have to realize that the father didn't even make an exception for his only son. When you think about when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, and he said, you know, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. So he was like, look, God, if you, you know, if it's your will, let it pass from me. But through tears, the Bible says, you know, his um, sweat was so thick, it was like drops of blood. That's how much it, he was in distress. So even him, the Lord didn't take suffering away from him. But I like what it says in Hebrews 5. I wanted to read that concerning Jesus and his obedience. Hebrews 5 and 7 says, Who in the days of the flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So even though he was Jesus, he you know he was the one that created the earth. He still obeyed the Father. He suffered. The Bible said he, he cried. He had tears, but that didn't take away from the fact that the Father needed him to go through that for us. And I think about when I first gave my life to the Lord, I thought my relationship with God was going to be like my relationship with my father and my mother. Every time I cried. It was like they gave me what I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All I had to do was cry. <laughs> they would see tears welling in my eyes. And they were like, well, she's soft-hearted. Go ahead and let her do it. You know? And I remember, you know, the first couple years, I would be crying. I'm like, Lord, I don't understand. And nothing would happen. And so finally, he had to sit me down one day. He was like, he really just spoke to me and said, you've got to learn. This, this is, our relationship is not like that relationship. You can't cry and get your way. And I'm like, really, God? You know, I was just really confused. But I, I saw and I was taught, and I'm so glad that he allowed me to suffer some things because I learned that God is God, and he is still faithful. And it helped me to mature in Christ. I was no longer this little baby, this little girl that cried about every little thing, but I became strong. So again, just because he was the son of God didn't take away the fact that he had to suffer. And there's some good things in suffering. You learn obedience. You learn that God is faithful. You don't have to go off somebody else's testimony, but you know for yourself that God will come through. And it strengthens your faith in who he is. It's nothing like being confident that your daddy is going to show up any moment. You know, he is, you know, the shadow of the, of the Almighty is covering you. He's your protector. So, again, even Jesus suffered. So we're not going to escape suffering, but we can learn some things through what we suffer. You, you know what's really interesting? Um, there's a verse of scripture, and it makes this statement. He that suffers is free from sin. And I have I, I read that, and it took me a long time to figure that out. I mean, it sounds simple. But he that suffers ceases from sin. And, you know, I, I was like, well, Lord, does that mean then that if I don't suffer, I'm sinning? Yeah, I mean, I just played around so many different ways, but I, then I began to, to see people suffering around me. And I began to see Christians that were suffering. And I began to see new believers that were suffering. Some dying of cancer, of all kind of diseases, all kind of uh, things, and they would suffer a long time. And it bothered me. I, have you ever... No, no, I'm going to go ahead and say it. I might as well. Have you ever prayed to God go ahead and transition somebody? 
because of what you're going through, because of all the suffering you were seeing. Well, I mean, I may be the only one, but I don't think so. <laughs> but you know, God gave me that scripture one once, and, and and when he gave it to me, I began to, to mull around with it, and finally I got some understanding. You know, it's impossible to suffer in the Lord and continue sinning. It's just not possible because the, 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 the God in you wants to be close to the God who is all God, which means as you go through, you focus more on what's the most important thing. If somebody gave you a sentence today that you're going to be dead in 30 days, I guarantee you would clear most of your calendar. It would be clear. You, you begin to look at priorities that you got, and you begin to say, that's not important. That's not important. That's not important. By the time you got through, the only thing that's important is I need to live what little life I've got to the best that I can. And I'm going to see God within the next 30 days. So I think I need to begin to make some kind of peace with the Lord, my maker. Come on now. Some, some, some of us, we didn't die if we feel that way. <laughs> we just thought we were going to die. But you need to understand that when it comes to serving God, it's not one-sided. Certainly, God blesses us. Certainly, he'll make you the head and not the tail. Certainly, he'll take you above and not beneath. He's going to bless you going in. He's going to bless you coming out. He's going to bless everything in glory where the glory comes out. Everything's going to happen according to God's word. But you need to understand your focus, if, if it's on that, you're missing the mark. Because you got to understand that when he said, I'm going to give you everything you gave up for the kingdom, mm -hmm. he also said, with persecution. It's in the book. In the red writing. So I'm telling you right now, the Lord said that. The Lord said, oh, you're going to prosper. Oh, you're going to be uh, above and not beneath. But listen, there's going to be persecution with hardships. People are going to hate you. People are going to come against you. People are going to work against you. Everybody's going to try to get their piece of your pie. So you need to understand, if, you, if you're not balanced, if you're focused on that, then whenever it's gone, you're gone. Whenever it gets low, you get low. Sometimes you can check the temperature of somebody's joy by how much money they got in their pocket. If they got a pocket full of money, they're jumping all over the place, shouting and praising the Lord. If they ain't got two wooden nickels to rub together, you can't even talk to them. They're nervous and mean and hateful and spiteful. I'm not talking about sinners here. I'm talking about saints. That, that lets you know right away that, hey, my focus is off. I'm out of balance. What is the right balance? The right balance is to recognize that if Jesus suffered, you're going to suffer. He did not come to take away your suffering. He came to let you see the other side of suffering. Listen, daughters, I'm telling you right now, when you look on the other side, then you got something to rejoice about. Over here, I might lose a leg. I might lose an eye. I might lose an arm. But on the other side, I'm whole. Whenever, whenever I get my glorified body, it's not going to be cut into pieces. It's not going to be like ashes. It's going to be a full-blown glorified body. Whenever everything is said and done, they may spit on my grave. But in heaven, God will love me so much that my rewards, I probably won't even be able to carry them. There'll be so many. So what are you saying? So what? You're going to have hardship. So what you're going to go through? Only two churches pleased God, and they were going through. Look at the church of Philadelphia, Revelation 3, 8 and 13. He told that church, he said, I'm setting before you an open door. Do you know what an open door is that the Lord says before? That means whatever's on the other side of that door, on the Lord's side, mm -hmm. he makes sure it gets to your side. That's an open door. Well, he told him, he said, I set before you an open door. Why did I set before you an open door? He said, number one, you had a little strength. Mm -hmm. 
See, you, you, you don't understand. A lot of us think we've got to be superhuman saints for us to really have God open the door uh, for us or in our behalf. No, just a little strength. If you get to the point where you say, I give up and don't, it's okay. If you get to the point where you say, ah, Lord, I'm just through, I'm done, I quit, I'm not going to do it anymore. Then come snaking on back to the Lord, Lord. I was a little, you know, I was a little rough, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and live another day. I used to do this thing with God when it got so tough for me that I couldn't take it. I said, well, Lord, I'm going to give another second to you. But if something don't happen on the next second, I'm out of here. Guess what? 60 seconds go by. There's a minute. I said, well, Lord, I've been here a minute. Nothing's happened. Okay, Lord, when it's been an hour, I'm getting up out of here. Sixty minutes go by and it's been an hour. And the Lord still hadn't showed up. <laughs> and I said, well, Lord, it's been an hour. Well, you know what, Lord, it's been a good hour. I hadn't suffered a whole I believe I could last another 24 hours. So, Lord, if you don't show up in 24 hours, then I'm quitting. <laughs> and guess what? 24 hours, the Lord hadn't showed up, but it's been so good over that 24 hours. You know, so many things are going. I said, well, you know what, Lord? It's not as bad as I thought it was. You know, it's been a day. You know what, Lord? If you don't show up at the end of this week, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> a week would go by. I said, well, Lord, you know what? It's been a week. Uh, well, I think I'm going to go another 50 or so weeks. And why not? I've been 47 years doing that. <laughs> you know what? And, and so it's not bad to say I give up, but it's bad to give up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can say anything you want to say. You know what? I fuss with God. Somebody said, well, you're, you're, you're God. You're never going to argue with God. What God said, God does, and that's the end of the story. No, it ain't never been in the story of me. No, I, I mean, I, I fuss with God. I argue with God. I tell God how I feel. I can't tell y'all how I feel because y'all put me in jail or, or put, take me out of church. I can tell God how I feel. I say, Lord, I, I, I hate this or I hate that or I hate the other. And Lord, I tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that, that you know, I pay them back. I mean, I talk all kinds of things with God. But you know what? Once I get it all out of me, I hear it coming out of my mouth. And I realize that is just stupid on steroids. I mean, that is just crazy. <laughs> So I said, Lord, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And the Lord, the, the Lord hadn't said a word while I was going out talking. But then he lets me know in my spirit that he forgives me. You know, and that's the thing. He won't say a word while you're arguing and fussing. Well, he'll let you have it get it. He wants you to get it all out. Go ahead, get it all out. Get it out. Go ahead and say everything because I don't care what you say. Say everything you say, just don't blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. But say whatever you want to say. Do whatever you want to do. Call me anything you want to call me. Say anything to me. Say anything to my son. You want to just don't blaspheme against the Holy Ghost because there's no forgiveness there. But say it all to me. Well, I say I get it all out. And once I get it all out, then it's out. I say, I'm about like the the uh, the, the comedy skit. Did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> or did I say that? <laughs> you know, I feel so I feel so bad. I'm like, Lord, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and the Lord just says, I know, son, it's all right. It's all right. Better me than somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so I began to understand. Every time somebody misuses me, abuses me, or makes fun of me, or does something crazy to me, you know what I think within myself? Well, if they weren't doing it to me, they'd be doing it to somebody else. And I guess what? I can take it. <clears throat> and they may can't, and they may lose out, but... If they're doing it to me, they can't be doing it to somebody else at the same time. So I can take it. You, 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 I know this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any, any common sense at all. But it makes all the spiritual sense in the world. This Philadelphia church, he said, you have a little bit of strength. He said, but you kept my word. Mm -hmm. He said, and you didn't deny my name. See, these are the things that are important to God. Not how big an offering you give. Not how well-dressed you are. Not how big your congregation is. Not how big your denomination is. Not how many dots you dotted and I's you've crossed. But the bottom line is, in dotting those I's and crossing those T's, did you keep 
the word of God? Did you spend that time promoting the Lord instead of denying the fullness of who he is? That's important. God told that Philadelphia church, he said, I said before you, open door. You know, that, that's a great thing. When, when that door is open, that means that everything God's got, you're entitled to. That's right. And we have to remember, sometimes when life seems to deal us shut doors, we have to remember it was not God. You know, if he shut an open door before us, no man can close it. And I remember, you know, years ago I had applied for a promotion, several promotions on that job. Because I felt like I just wanted to get out of the job I was doing. And the first two times, you know, it was like the door was shut in my face. But the last one I applied for, I got the job, and the Lord showed me favor. And in hindsight, I saw why he allowed me. He opened this door for the last job. And I'm like, thank God you didn't let me get those other two jobs. So, again, a lot of times we think we need this or we need that, and the doors are shut. Remember, it's not God, because he said if I open a door, no man can shut it. So, if it's been shut, it's not God. So, I think about what David said in Psalm 103. And how our life can go that way. He, talk, he talks about the benefits of the Lord. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. He's naming all these benefits. And then he says, who redeemeth my life from destruction. And I always think about all the doors that have been shut in my life that I felt like, no, I need this. I got to do that. And the doors were shut. But I realized that Lord was saving my life from a whole lot of destruction. And that's how it is with us sometimes. We feel like we got to have this or we got to have this. We got to do that. But remember, if God opens a door, no man can shut it. So if it's a door being shut, then that means it ain't God. Because when he opens the door, no man can shut it. And, and, and you know, you, you got to understand from God's perspective the decisions that you make. Now, I remember I was working at an um, a, a, um, electric blanket factory. I was making $400 a week. This was in 1978. That was real good money back in 1978. And um, in, in making that money, I was on second shift. And I was missing all the revivals and the services and the meeting. And I was, I'd only been saved just a year. So I needed the word. I needed to grow. I needed to learn more. So I woke up one morning. And I made a decision. I said, you know what? I'm quitting my job. I said, I'm not going to make sure. I went first. I went and quit the job. That was stupid, but that's what I did. I went and quit the job. <laughs> then I went and got the newspaper. And I was looking for one thing, a day job. There was only <clears> one <throat> job open. And it was a job to a warehouse, a wholesale grocery warehouse, loading and unloading trucks. Hard manual labor. Guaranteed minimum wages. Which was half of what I was making. I went and signed up to the, to, to do the job. And it was, man, it was horrible. I mean, it was no air conditioning and no heating in the warehouse. It was horrible. Terrible. And I, I was making a, a, only half of what I was making. So everybody in my family, everybody was, was going through it. I was, I, but I was able to get to church, and I was able to get into revivals. I was able to get to all the different teachings. Of it. So I was happy, but I was sad on that job. And I'm telling you every day, and I had a boss. He was the whole, he was the supervisor over the whole thing. And he would come to me. You know how you get your little drink breaks, and you know, a little time you get. He would come to me, and he'd say, uh, Earl, how about going to see how many cases of Clorox we got or how many cases of uh, washing powder we got. It was always something. He always came to me. There was about six of us in that warehouse. He always came to me. I had to lay my food down. I had to lay my stuff down and go capture. Here I go. And all the rest of them were like, fuck you, fuck you. They were picking, picking at me, but I would go ahead and do it. I, now, I'm not telling you I was doing it with a smile. Now, I'm not going to tell you that. My, my lips were poked out and everything. I thought I went ahead and did it. Come back and told him. And he did this. The more I did it, the more he called on me. He'd be sitting in his butt in the office with that. Earl, how about going and seeing how many quarts of, uh, of, of, of vinegar we got back there? How many cases? And I'm like, I'm busy. He's sitting on his butt. Why can't he go do it? But I, you know, I, I went, I, you know how you talk to yourself. I never said I went on and did it. 
And this man, his name was Tom Jones. I'll never forget it because he was just like the, the singer. But this man was about 6'9", weighed probably about 185 pounds. I mean, he was the bill. He looked like he was going to live forever. And one day he just said, you know what, I've been feeling a little strange. I'm going to go to the doctor. He went to the doctor, never came out of the hospital, was dead in just four or five days. Dead. I mean, graveyard dead. Well, guess what? Nobody knew what he was doing because he kept it all to himself. So nobody knew how to control inventory. But you. <laughs> but me. <laughs> so whenever the, the office manager... When he came out and he said, uh, you know, I don't know. I've been in this office. I do all the bookkeeping. I do all of that stuff, the order. Stuff. He said, I don't know how, what he was doing. Does anybody out here have any idea how he controlled this inventory, <laughs> how he did this and so? You know what? I said, I do. He said, well, how do you know? I said, because he always counted me. He goes, count the stuff. He looked at me and said, you know what? You've just been promoted. You got his job. He say he I moved from loading and unloading chair, uh, trucks to having an inventory of a half a million dollars. I mean, I was ordering truck loads of, of grocery. Just, I mean, they called the salespeople come in there. They would be whining and dining me. You know how they want you to buy certain. I mean, they gave me all kind of gifts. And, I mean, I was very, and and this, this was now. Now get this. This was within a year, one year of leaving that job. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I was making three times what I had been making on the job with the electric blanket company. I mean, it was great. It was wonderful. So you see, I made a decision. I made a choice that I was going to do everything in my power to get as much knowledge and understanding of God as I could. And it looked bad at first. But you see, when you do something with your mind on God, when you do something with your sight set on getting more of God, God's going to bless you. God, I mean, listen, darlings, you all out here tonight, this is not, this is, you could be doing a whole bunch of stuff. You'll be watching uh, gun smoke or something. <laughs> <laughs> you could be watching some good show or something. You'll be relaxed and chilling. Been working some of you. I mean, listen, you got to understand when you do something in the favor of God, yes. then that means you're not denying him. Mm -hmm. It means you're supporting him. And God's going to bless you. Mm -hmm. Just don't think it's going to come with no strings attached because once the devil and his crew see you being blessed, then they're going to do everything in their power to try and make you think that you're not blessed. That's right. And most of the time, if you look, walk by sight and not by faith, they will convince you that you have done the wrong thing. That's why God said we walk not by sight, but by faith. I'm doing what I do not because I, I already got it. I'm doing what I do because I know I'm going to get it. See, that's what faith is. Faith is not going around uh, acting like you uh, you already got it. But faith is going around knowing that if you believe in God, you're going to get it. And when you get it, guess what? You got it. <laughs> Nobody can take it from you. Amen. And God always rewards faithfulness. You know, when he was telling the church that they have kept his patience and his word, I think about what the psalmist said in Psalm 91. At the end of that stanza, the last three verses, he said, Because he has set his love on me, therefore I will I deliver him, and I will set him on high. Because he has known my name, he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. So the Lord was saying, Because he set his love on me, because he set his affection and set attention on me, I'm going to deliver him. I'm going to give him long life. So when you keep his word, there are benefits to, to keeping God's word and being patient and knowing that God is going to come through for you, regardless of what it looks like. You know, at the end of that, the beginning of that psalm, it talks about, you know, being covered under the shadow of the Almighty and being kept from the pestilence and all these kind of things. So even with the pestilence in this world, and this time we had COVID-19, you know, we had all this stuff going through. 
But because our love was set on the Lord, he kept us, and we're still here. And he's going to satisfy us with long life. But when you love God, he's going to protect you, and he's going to keep you. So never feel like you don't see the results, or I don't see why I'm living for God. You know, I don't see anything. Every day I get up, and I can breathe, and I can see, and I can hear. I'm like, thank you, God, for another day. That's a blessing in and of itself. And sometimes we can take the small things for granted until we don't have them anymore. So I'm always thanking God. Thank you for keeping me in this world. And that's what we have to understand. If you live right, if you keep God's word, he's going to reward you. And it's going to be beyond what you could ever think or imagine. Remember, you're going to reap what you sow. If you're sowing love, you're going to reap love. If you're sowing um, goodness and faithfulness, you, it's going to come back to you. But the Bible says, in due season. So don't give up before your season gets here. You know, don't expect your harvest before it gets here. And I think about Roger, you, you know, you were farming. So you don't plant something one day and expect it to jump up the next day. It's a seasonal thing. And that's how we have to be with the Lord. Continue in his word. Keep his word. Be faithful in the little things. And he's going to reward us with much. But it's going to come in due season. We can't get out of patience and feel like, like he was saying, if you don't come today, I'm quitting. You can't be like that. <laughs> So again, keep going. Keep his word and be patient. Don't get bitter. Get better. Don't get bitter. Get better. Too many of God's people are getting bitter. Mad, upset, angry, disappointed, discouraged. No, get better. If something's going on in your life, find a word from the Lord. That lets you know what the end result is going to be. Stop being so focused on what you're going through. And look for the end results. Look for what it's going to accomplish in your life. Recognize that as a believer, as a Christian, you're going to prosper. But you're also going to have tests. You're also going to have trials. You're also going to have afflictions. You're also going to have tribulations. You know what tribulation is? Three times the trouble. You're always going to have, you're going to have that anyway. But don't get out of balance. Don't focus so much as to what you have in your hand as you focus on what God has in his hand. And instead of wanting what's in God's hand, want what's in God's heart. Because if you want what God's in, God has in his heart, mm -hmm. then you're going to have everything in his hand. Mm -hmm. You need to understand, David had a, a testimony with God. God said, David is a man after my own heart. Make sure everything you do is centered on getting close to God. Mm -hmm. Recognize he's the one. And whatever you're going through, stop letting folks jerk you around because you may not have what everybody else has got. Amen. Who knows what God's going to do with you? Some folks say, well, I'm getting old now. Well, you're older than, than uh, uh, Colonel uh, Sanders who started KFC. He was like, I believe, 69 years old when he started that franchise. Mm -hmm. you, know, you you, you got to understand, age in the sight of God, not in the sight of man, not in the sight of your body, probably not even in the sight of your mind. But in God, age is only a number. God gave Moses the responsibility of leading two million people out of bondage when he was 80 years old. Went through 40 years of wilderness with them yahoos. <laughs> <laughs> and at 120 years old, the Bible said his eyes weren't weak. He didn't need glasses. His mind was still sharp. He wasn't uh, caught up in dementia or forgetfulness. And he was just as sturdy and steady a man as you could, could ever imagine. And God said, whenever Israel was getting ready to go in the promised land, God said to him, Moses, you're not going. Because you dishonored me before my people. He said, but well, come on. I'm going to take you to a special place and we're going to have a special funeral just for you. And I'm going to hide your body 
but I'm going to take you in the glory myself. Now that's what, that's what I call a testimony. And Aaron, the Bible said that Aaron, God told Aaron, you're not going either. And the Bible said the moment they took the priestly garment off of Aaron, he dropped dead. I'm, I'm telling you, this is real stuff. It's in the book. It's in the Bible. Don't look for a prosperity gospel. Look for a prosperity God. And when you serve a prosperity God, then put your life in his hands. The Apostle Paul said it this way, and I mean, I love it the way he said it. He said, I know what it's like to be prosperous. He said, I know what it's like to be a babe, a lord. He said, but in all of these things, I'm still blessed. I'm still all right. He said, I still know how to become all things to all men that I might by all means win some. He said, I'm not going to win them all. But just so I can get a little bit of a nugget, just so I can get a handful, it's okay. Say that in your spirit that these end times, there's some things that you need to know. Number one, the church is not going through the tribulation period. It is not. Okay, you can cut your little phone off or whatever you want to if you believe otherwise. But listen, according to the word of God, the church is not going through the tribulation. It's settled. I still believe that in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, that the trumpet shall sound. And those of us that are alive when it happens, we're going to be caught up. Somebody said rapture ain't in the Bible. The <laughs> definition of rapture is in the Bible. What's the definition of rapture? To be caught, caught up. up. As far as I'm, 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 I'm concerned, you ain't got to give me the word. Give me the definition. If you give me the definition, I'm okay. And somebody said, well, what about the dead in Christ? They're going to rise first. Well, listen. The dead in Christ is just, just the bodies. It ain't the spirit and the soul. When we come up, when we show up, when we come up, get this, with the Lord, first resurrection is going to be our glorified bodies. I'm not talking a, a body, I mean a spiritual resurrection. I'm talking a bodily resurrection. You can put all the scriptures you want to, sir. I mean, I heard that in the spirit realm. Somebody said, well, I got scriptures. Just pull all you want to pull. And you believe all you want to believe. I'm going to believe what I believe. And I tell you what, whenever my time comes to transition, if I don't get caught up, I'm going to rejoice every step of the way. But I guarantee you one thing, my life will be better than your life because I had the kind of hope that keeps on living. And I believe what the Lord said. He said, those that die in me shall live again. And those that live in me shall never die. I believe it. So you you go ahead for I'm not gonna argue with you. I'm not gonna fight with you. You go ahead and have have your field day. I will surrender the floor to you. Because I'm confident that what the word says is true. And I'm gonna wait it out. I'm gonna wait it out. Why? Because I'm confident of this one thing. God is not, not like man that he should lie, nor the son of man, that he should repent. And what God said, he said, if I said it, I will do it. When he told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, make you the father of many nations. The Bible said, he said, I'm not going to swear on you. I'm not going to depend on what you can do. I'm going to swear on myself. God said, because I can't find no one greater in truth than me, I swear to myself that I'm going to bless your socks off. Now, what kind of God is that? In case you weren't, that was Carnegie paraphrasing. <laughs> 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 but it's in the book. It's in the book. 
So, so you mm. see, you, you, you may be wondering, well, what, what about these churches? Why we spent so much time? I needed you to see that the bottom line is it's not sugar and spice and everything nice. We are not going to suffer the way they're going to suffer in the tribulation period. But when it gets close to that period of time, things are going to get tight. People are going to go crazy. Right now, today, folks are killing believers that don't believe like they believe. I mean, it's going on. It's crazy stuff going on. You know, people are just going, have just lost their, as they can, they used to say when I was the growing up, they have lost their cotton picking minds. <laughs> yeah, we used to pick cotton when I was growing up. But they've lost their minds. You need to understand God has not changed. Mm -hmm. And what he required <clears throat> 2,000 years ago, he requires the same thing today. Amen. But we can overcome. And I think about what it says in that verse 12 on your last page. It says, he that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God, and he shall go out, go no more out. And I think about what that pillar, when it says make a pillar, you know, a support system strong. And I look at my life and how my spiritual life parallels with my, my natural life a lot. Because when I was younger, you know, I, I was very, very clumsy. I broke both my arms, one of my legs, <laughs> I busted my chin. It was like, it was just, I was really, really bad. You know, I would be in the other room and something would break. And instead of calling my other sisters and brothers, they knew it was me. Because I could look at something and it would fall. I would run into stuff. But, you know, even as an adult now, it's almost like my parents, especially my mother, looks at me and I'm like, man, she made it. <laughs> she is functioning really well. <laughs> but I love the fact that I overcame that. I over, And there's moments that I'm still clumsy, you know. <laughs> but I overcame all those other obstacles. And it's the same thing in the spiritual realm. Now I can see how God has made me a pillar because he's strengthening me and I'm able to be a support for someone else you know when you look at me naturally you know you look like man she can't support anybody she needs help so again when you look at being to the point where you know that you can overcome through god god will make you a pillar and he'll make you a pillar in your house in your church wherever you are you will be a pillar of strength for those that are looking for light and looking for hope and god puts his name on you puts his stamp of approval on you Jesus said, you will be called by my name. And the Bible says, at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he is Lord. When you begin to look at your position yourself in the right way in these end times, mm -hmm. just remember this. You don't have to fight the devil. When you get to this place in God. Because it's like the the uh, uh, the seven sons of Sceva in the book of Acts. You know, they thought they would go and cast the devil out. And the Bible said they went. And they said, I adjure you in the name of the God that Paul calls on, on to come out. And you know what those demons said? They said, Paul, I know. Jesus I know. But who do you think you are? And the, and the Bible said he run them out naked. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, when you get to this place in God where you got your balance right, you don't have to be concerned about the devil coming at you. He leave you alone. Because he knows that even look at you wrong is to look at God wrong. And he knows that even everything you say is going to and he knows that when you speak, all the demons in hell have to bow down and back off. See, this is something that the body of Christ hasn't experienced yet because we haven't walked in that kind of faith. We're still wrestling with demons. We're still wrestling with the devil in all of our meetings. We're still wrestling with the devil in our house and in our job. But there's a place you can get to in God. Where just like at the mention of the Lord's name, every knee bows, when the demons hear your name, they're going to bow down and back off because you have the full anointed favor of dominion in your life. Okay. Ready? That's got to be it. Right. <laughs> Glory to God. Now we'll take your question.